Part two of Chapter six of Our Search for a Wilderness by Mary Blair Beebe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Day in the Jungle Near Hoorie. The region about Hoorie consists chiefly of small but steep hills, some isolated with a few hundred yards of flat land about them, others close together and separated by deep, narrow valleys with running water at the bottom. All drain into Hoorie Creek, which from the mine clearing runs in a fairly straight direction through flat, marshy land to the Barama River, up which we had come. The whole country is, of course, completely covered with a thick forest of good-sized trees, which are heavily draped with vines and parasitic plants, although these are not dense enough to shut out the sunlight. Thus, in many places, a heavy undergrowth is found, making it difficult to get about, while the steep ascents and equally precipitous descents into the numerous intersecting valleys make extended exploration an arduous task, especially in the directions away from Hoorie Creek. But in this land of superabundant life, one needs but a short walk to fill one's notebook with interesting facts. Let us spend a day in the jungle. In light marching order, with glasses and notebooks only, we started out in the direction of the great pit of golden gravel, and finding Nasua, the coolie, we persuaded him to pan a few shovelfuls of earth from the surface of the ground within reach of the spray of the water spouting up towards us. It was fascinating to watch his slender, deft fingers and his skillful manipulation of the gold pan. Filling it to overflowing with gray or red clay, he half sank it beneath the surface of a little pool and began rocking and turning it. Soon the large pebbles were all eliminated and only a muddy sediment left. This was washed and revolved until there seemed nothing but clear water when, as the last dirt was flowing over the rim, there came the flash of the golden grains. Pressing his fingers on these, the pan was reversed for a moment, and then, dipping his fingertips in the clear water of our glass vial, the yellow grains sank swiftly to the bottom. Sometimes only a half penny's worth would reward us, while again as much as a shilling's value would be shown. Passing over the ridge, we saw before us a deep and very narrow valley with precipitous sides, down which we slid and crawled, hanging on to vines and saplings to break our descent. At the bottom we found an interesting advance in the evolution of gold mining over the simplest form of gold panning. Two blacks were operating a long tom, which in mining vernacular is the name for a six-by-two, heavy, coarse metal sieve set obliquely in the channel of a small brook. The gold-bearing gravel and clay is shoveled into it and puddled with a hoe, and the gold settles to the bottom to be later panned. Thus division of labor enters in, one black shoveling while his partner puddles. We asked them how much they were getting out, and as usual they said almost nothing or a few shillings worth at the most this was to avoid any danger of their tiny holdings being considered too valuable and taken away from them mr wilshire took a pan here on another day and unearthed a tiny nugget worth perhaps two shillings much to the blacks discomfiture who hastened to explain that such an opulent find was indeed rare the poor fellows at best make little enough and it was pitiful to see the tiny packets of gold dust which they brought to the company's store at the end of the week to exchange for food or credit checks the universal guianan name for this type of independent miner is pork knocker the explanation being that by knocking the rocks to pieces they find just enough gold to procure the pork upon which they live. 
they are allowed to work on side streams near the large mining operations their total taking of gold being relatively insignificant while they sometimes locate valuable deposits in the course of their wanderings they are a jolly happy-go-lucky type apparently careless of their luck and invariably optimistic of the future a naturalist would find it difficult to keep his attention fixed on pan or long tom in this narrow glade for great iridescent blue morpho butterflies are floating about everywhere among the lights and shadows from some tall trees a continual shower of whirling objects are falling some white others purple catching one we find it to be a narrow petaled five-parted star-like blossom petroia arborea weighted by a slender stem when thrown up into the air they revolve like horizontal pinwheels falling slowly and forming a most remarkable rain of color forcing our way up the opposite slope and on through the underbrush we come out on a corduroy road half a mile from the mine as a corduroy sapling turns and splashes the water underfoot a cloud of orange and white butterflies arises and scatters through the woods suddenly through the warm damp stillness there rings out a piercing three-syllabled cry which was to become for us the vocal spirit of the guiana wilderness day after day we heard it wherever the unbroken primeval forest reigned but never near the haunts of man this with the roar of the red baboon and the celestial theme of the quadrille bird forms the trilogy most cherished in our memory of all the guiana sounds we are listening to the call of the gold or green heart bird another member of the cotingas or chatterers which is as remarkable for its voice as it is lacking in brilliant colors loud as the call is it is very ventriloquial and difficult to locate when directly beneath the sound it seems to come from the tops of the highest trees a hundred feet up whereas in all probability the bird is not more than twenty-five feet above our heads it sits motionless but the violence of its utterance makes the whole branch vibrate we soon learn that to search and find the bird directly is impossible but by letting the eyes take in as large a field as possible the vibration from the vocal effort is easily discernible the male gold bird is uniformly ashy or slate colored slightly darker above very solitaire like both in color and size the female is distinguished by a shade of rufous on the wing coverts and the tips of the flight feathers with such coloring it is not strange that the bird becomes invisible amid the dark shadows of the lower branches the natives know this bird as the ppo from its call and gold bird from the fact that all pork knockers believe it is never found far from deposits of gold while the theory that it usually utters its call from a green heart tree accounts for its third name its note is typical of our american tropics where highly developed song is rare but single loud metallic or liquid syllables are the rule the bird has two introductory phrases which heretofore seem to have escaped the notice of observers indeed until one noticed the invariable sequence of the two sets of notes it would never be suspected that they proceeded from the same bird the introductory phrases are low and muffled and yet have considerable carrying power they possess the indescribable vibrating chord-like quality of the viri's song which defies all description almost instantly follow the three notes of the call or song they are of tremendous strength and exceedingly liquid and piercing the nearest imitation is to whistle the syllables whee whee oh 
as loudly as possible. We never tire of listening. The bird overhead calls so loudly that our ears tingle. Another answers, then a third and a fourth far away in the dim recesses of the forest. Many miles inland, near the wonderful plateau of Roraima, lives another species of gold bird, similar to ours except for a bright rosy pink collar around the neck. We saw nothing of this beautiful Cotinga, but one of the gold birds which we secured has a distinct but irregular collar of rufous, hinting of a not distant relationship. A short distance along the corduroy road we came upon a half dozen naked Indians, cutting away underbrush preparatory to making a new road bed. It was a delight to watch their sinewy bodies bend and strain, moving here and there through the thorns and sharp twigs with never a scratch. They came across many curious creatures among the rotting trunks and leaf mold, and when they learned we were interested, they would tie their captives with liana threads or imprison them in clever leaf boxes and save them for us. The most weird-looking of these were gigantic whip scorpions or pedipalp spiders, Admetus pumilio, like Brobdignanian daddy longlegs, which crawled painfully about on their slender legs and never showed an inclination to bite. They were of great size, stretching some eight and a half inches across. The three hinder pairs of legs were normal and used for walking while the fourth pair was attenuated and functioned as feelers, the whips measuring full ten inches in length. The jaws were most terrible organs, three inches long, dovetailed with wicked spines, while the tips ended in villainous fangs. A few hundred yards further we came to a small clearing where the squaws were cooking dinner. The houses of these happy people are of the simplest construction four poles support a roof covered with loose palm thatch open on all sides the hammocks are hung beneath this and an open fire is built in the center the guiana indians are unequaled exponents of the simple life in the deep jungle we are constantly impressed with the straightness of all the trunks the lianas and bush ropes may be scalloped or spiral or with a multitude of little steps like the monkey ladder and still easily reach the life-giving light high overhead but the trees can afford no bends or curves or gnarly trunks they rise like temple columns cell must be on cell each to aid in the life race upward there are seldom high winds here in the great calm hothouse everywhere between the great trunks whitish in the crabwood, smoothed and noted in the Congo pump, and deeply fluted in the paddle woods. Beneath all these mast-like forms are draped the slender rat-line threads and cables of the aerial rigging. We seat ourselves on a prostrate trunk, free of scorpions, at one side of the corduroy road, and watch and listen. Beside us, on a tiny dull red mora sprout, eating voraciously, is a caterpillar, branched and rebranched with a maze of nettle hairs, while near it is another, a fuzzy fellow, who gives us one of the most unexpected surprises of the whole trip. As we first see him, he is palest lavender in color, covered with long straight hairs longer than those of our familiar black and brown woolly bear caterpillar of the north five minutes later we look again and see a third caterpillar or no it is the second one but remarkably changed a creature flat and immovable covered with a score of recurved pink tufts of curled hair the caterpillar Chameleon has flattened his long pelage of lavender into a thin line of prostrate down, bringing into view the recurved pink tufts, and thus has become an entirely different object, both as to shape, color,
color and pattern there must be a special set of muscles controlling these hairs even if a bird had appetite to digest such an unsavory pure sweet object it would well be dismayed at the transformation everywhere we observe examples of protective form or coloration on the underside of a branch in front of us are what appear to be many tufts of blackish moss until we brush against some of it and a few of the tufts resolve into dense bunches of caterpillars others which we touch on purpose to see if they be caterpillars or not deceive us doubly by retaining their vegetable character on the ground at our feet are scattered seed sheaths which have fallen from the branches high overhead there are myriads of them suddenly one takes legs to itself and moves and only after examining it closely do we know it for a beautiful brown elater a beetle semiotus ligneus embossed with pale ivory a perfect living counterpart of the arboreal seed sheaths strewn all about words completely fail to give an idea of the wonder and delight of having one's senses set at naught by these devices of nature after being taken in by several we imagine we see them everywhere in innocent leaves or a bit of lichens many travelers wallace and bates among them speak often of the scarcity of flowers in the tropics but here at hoori and on our later expeditions we were hardly ever out of sight of blossoms a few feet behind us as we sit on the log are two solomon seal like plants castus species eighteen inches high with the stem and leaves growing in a wide ascending spiral making one revolution throughout its course a sheaf of flower heads appears at the top of the plant with a single white open flower giving forth the sweetest perfume bell-shaped it is formed by a single sweeping petal the edges opposed along the summit and the mouth rimmed with the finest hair-like fringe the slit in the upper part is protected by a second narrow petal recurved at the tip showing the heart within such a blossom would be a splendid addition to our conservatories and a vast harvest awaits the grower of tropical plants other than orchids now the morning half gone rain falls a gentle mist light as dew refreshing and pleasant through the drops to the blossom comes a great morpho butterfly of blue tinsel soon followed by a big yellow papilio a tiny white butterfly bordered with black dashes up and attacks the papilio with fury driving it away as a kingbird vanishes a hawk just as we are about to arise a gold bird calls in the distance and then without warning a beautiful song rings out close at hand six or eight clear descending notes like the early morning chant of the wood hewer but even more liquid running together at the last into a maze of warbling which continues for eight or ten seconds then ceases and the liquid notes form an exquisite finale of a trio of sweet phrases the singer is invisible we never learn what it is but it deserves a place near the head of the songsters even of temperate climes as we walk along toucans and other birds fly high overhead with whirring beats of their drenched wings woodhewers loop from trunk to trunk and peer at us as we pass while ant birds fly here and there in all our tramps through thick jungles these two latter families are in the majority the former hitching up the trunks like brown woodpeckers of various sizes the latter simulating wrens warblers and sparrows in action and often in voice one a white-shouldered pygmy ant bird now flits ahead of us tiny as a wren 
slate colored with white dots on the lesser coverts of the wings and a dotted bar across the wings the flanks and under wings are white and although ordinarily concealed yet the little fellow flirts his wings every second thus flashing out the color and making himself most conspicuous his call note is low and inarticulate but he occasionally lisps a pleasing little song choo choo chooey we enter a deep narrow gully our feet sinking deep in moss and mold trip over a hidden root and looking back see a magnificent rhinoceros beetle which we have disturbed feebly kicking his six legs in the air in these deep valleys the air is saturated with reeking odors woody spicy and moldy and altogether delightful moss grows on the stems of the plants like wide radiating fans of delicate green lace in these places we find the commonest palms which grow near hoori stemless with fronds springing fern-like from the ground leaving the vicinity of the trail we start out through the heart of the jungle keeping by compass in a general northwest direction here the trees increase in size and grow almost thirty feet apart the intervening space being filled with lesser growth parasitic lianas and huge ferns eight to twelve feet in height tree ferns in size but not in mode of growth the rain now increases and we plod happily along drenched to the skin giving ourselves up to the delight of a walk in a tropical downpour serenely oblivious of pools and dripping branches we trudge along until finally a tacuba over a creek breaks with our weight and we splash in up to our waists indeed we had long ago become accustomed to such drenchings for during our stay at hoori the days were alternate sunshine and shower in starting out for a long tramp we never thought of taking any protection against the rain the only thing to be shielded was the precious camera what matters a wetting when one is perfectly dressed for whatever may happen a word must be said here from the woman's point of view about the costume which was adopted as being absolutely suited to the bush life in the first place it was light so light that one never felt the burden of a single superfluous ounce of weight and when thus freed from the drag of heavy clothing one would come in unfatigued from tramps which would have been impossible for a woman in orthodox dress no matter how short the skirt but in the light khaki knickerbockers loose negligee shirts of scotch flannel or fibrous cellular cloth stockings and tennis shoes and a waterproof felt hat one was ready for anything if soaked by a sudden downpour a few minutes walk in the sun would dry one if walking difficult tacubas or clambering over huge fallen trees of which there were any number throughout the forest or climbing precipitous and slippery hills one was never hampered by unsuitable dress of course there are many wildernesses where it is unnecessary for a woman to wear knickerbockers and there is no reason why she should defy public prejudice by doing so but the woman who attempts to tramp through the south american jungle will find that safety and comfort make them absolutely essential one realized as never before with what handicaps woman has tried to follow the footsteps of man with the result that physical exhaustion has robbed her of all the joys of life in the open returning to our day in the jungle we tramped silently over the sodden ground now and then sending some panic-stricken macaw or parrot screeching from its roost after an hour the rain ceased and the sun shone brightly but where we were many yards beneath the vast mat of treetop foliage only single spots and splashes of light broke the solid shadows 
for a long distance we trod silently on deep mold and moss and not a sound of beast or bird broke the stillness as we were crossing a swirling creek on the trunk of a mighty fallen tree something fluttered ahead we could not see what it was closer we came and still the object remained indistinct we seemed to see a butterfly and yet it appeared impossible at last we marked it down on a fern frond and crept up until our eyes were within two feet nothing was visible but the graceful lacery of the frond until a slanting beam of sunlight struck it and there close before us was the ghost of a butterfly it spread fully three inches but was wholly transparent save for three tiny spots of azure near the edge of the hind wings hytera piera as we looked it drifted to a double-headed flower of scarlet and when it alighted the scarlet of the flower and the green of the leaf were as distinct as if seen through thin mica while the faint gray haze of the insect's wings were marked only by the indistinct venation the appearance of this ghostly butterfly amid the silence and awe-inspiring stillness of the reeking jungle was most impressive then came an interruption so sudden and unrelenting that it seemed to reach to the very heart of nature a red baboon raised his voice less than fifty yards away and even the leaves seemed to tremble with the violence of the outburst of sound a long deep rasping vibrating roar followed by a guttural inhalation hardly less powerful after a dozen connected roars and inbreathings the sound descended to a slow crescendo almost died away and then broke out with renewed force we crept swiftly toward the sound treading as softly as possible and soon in a high bullet wood we saw three of the big red monkeys the male passed on out of sight and the second a medium-sized animal followed the third was a mother with her baby clinging tightly to her back she climbed slowly showing her rich light golden red fur and beard while the arms and legs of her dark furred baby were revealed as lines of darker color around her body twenty minutes later we stalked another roaring male and found four in this troop we saw two of the females giving voice with the leader shrill falsettos which became audible only during the less deafening inspiration we tried to think of a simile for the voice of this monkey and could only recur to that which always came to mind the roar of wind ushering in a cyclone or terrific gale and yet there was ever present to the ear the feeling of something living as if mingled with the elemental roar was the howl of a male jaguar no sound ever affected us quite as this seeming always to prestige some unnamed danger while it lasted the sense of peace which had been inspired by the calmness and silence of the jungle gave place to a hidden portent of evil yet we loved it and the savage delight which we took in this and other wilderness sounds made our pulses leap end of part two of chapter six Part three of chapter six of Our Search for a Wilderness by Mary Blair Beebe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Drowned Forest. At the engine house, a ten foot dam had been thrown across the Hoorie Creek bed, and the apparently slight cause had brought about wide reaching effects. This slight raising of the water throwing back the creek in many directions one could hardly call it a lake as there was no wide body of water and yet it had the shoreline of more than ten miles 
reaching out a long finger-like extension up every side valley the original creek was only a few feet wide and the jungle grew down to the very bank so now the trees were deep under water all which were below the new level were dead standing like an array of tall bare ghosts compared to the luxuriant forest all about when on a rise of ground one could trace the course of the lake by the lines of naked branches and when steering one's canoe between the leafless trunks the effect was most startling the sunlight came through in a way different from any tropical forest every leaf had fallen leaving the trees as bare as in a northern winter and stripping the vines and bush ropes but the condition of the parasites and air plants was most interesting all which were truly parasitic living on the life sap of their hosts were of course also dead but the orchids and other air plants were flourishing showing as large tufts or sprays of light green here and there in places the branches had a beaded effect so numerous and yet so isolated were the epiphytes we drifted silently along by the impetus of a touch of the paddle on a passing trunk orchids were in blossom and ferns mosses and lichens ran riot in orange brown and ivory patches on the tree trunks muricots and the fierce perai were abundant here and now and then some fish broke water throwing rings of light into the shadowy places spiders ants and a host of other wingless insects were crawling on many of the trunks made captive by the flood their inability to walk on the water was evident when we knocked some of them off so they must have lived on their island trees for the last year the time of existence of the dam the spiders were legion in species hardly two alike from minute ones shaped like nothing else under heaven with relatively enormous hooks and thorns on their brightly colored abdomens to giant tarantulas who stood up and threatened us before beating a dignified retreat the increase of water had attracted many water-loving birds and great rufous kingfishers swung past us strong-winged beautiful birds carrying on their business of life in a virile unhesitating way between the trunks flashed the white banded swallows now hovering before a trunk and snatching a spider now dipping at full speed for a floating gnat a hollow rattling drew our attention upward and there gazing intently down at us was a splendid woodpecker the guiana ivory bill close kin to our ivory bill of the florida swamps imagine a big woodpecker with dark brown back wings and tail while the long erect crest head neck and breast are bright scarlet shading into rich rufous on the underparts such a beauty looked down at us and then without sign of fear dived into a hole the indians passing several times a day with loads of cordwood in their ballyhoos or flat-bottomed boats were familiar with the woodpecker and asserted that the bird had no mate it was a male and although we visited the place several times no female ever appeared the dead tree which held the nest was called aramaca by the indians and was about a foot and a half in diameter with the entrance not less than sixty feet above the water a living tree like it on the bank near by had obtuse entire leaves and large brown slightly curved pods the trunk was rotten especially at the water line and as it could not have remained standing much longer we decided to investigate the home of this little known bird we hailed the first indians who appeared and set them to work felling the tree the woodpecker flew out at the first stroke of the axe and remained close by showing little fear or anxiety we landed 
and the Indians made the trunk fall in our direction. It struck the water with a terrific splash, breaking into several lengths, and finally coming to rest with the hole upward. Running out along the floating log, we found that the nest contained a single bird with no trace of addled eggs or other young. The opening was a circle four inches in diameter and the cavity fourteen inches deep. The young bird was about five days old, featherless and downless, but the sprouting feather tracts were very distinct. On the edge of the branches of the lower mandible, about three-quarters of the way to their base, were two round white knobs or warts, and a large white patch, like an abnormally large egg tooth, was at the tip of each mandible. These structures were undoubtedly direction marks for aiding the parent in finding the mouth of the young bird in the darkness of the nest chamber. When the mouth was open, they formed the four corners with the throat cavity in the center. A most remarkable collection of creatures gathered on the upper side of their wrecked tree, tenants of the bark and wood for the last year. Two small green-headed lizards made flying leaps and escaped ashore, but marooned for life were several species of bark beetles, Nycobates giganteus and Paxillus leachii, a huge boring beetle, and spiders galore. We noticed a slight disturbance among the bits of floating bark and pith, and scooped up a most wonderful creature, a true bug, perfectly flat, with the sides of its body drawn out into irregular flat serrations, while in color it was the very essence of lichened bark or dead leaf. Placed on a piece of wood, it instantly drew in its legs and clung tightly. If it had not been frightened by the water, we could have handled it a dozen times without knowing it was an insect. A few yards away, a pair of mealy Amazon parrots were shrieking and flying restlessly about a great mora tree, but we could not discover their nest. On our way home, a dainty blue honey creeper alighted on the bow of our canoe, rich deep blue except for wings, tail and throat, which were black. The feet and legs were clear yellow, showing most conspicuously against the plumage. A pair of great green caciques had swung their four-foot pendant nest from the tallest limb of a tree standing in the water, and we spent ten minutes watching the male court his mate. As he uttered his incoherent medley of liquid cowbell-like notes, he bent his neck, thrusting his head far downward and forward, and at the same time throwing both wings forward and around in a semicircle. As this curious action was completed, the vocal utterance came to a close, and the performance was over. The early stages of the evolution of such a courtship may be observed in our common cowbird of the north, and a further developed stage in the little Guiana cowbird. The City of the Caciques On the first day of our arrival, even before we came in sight of the clearing, we heard the cries of the splendid big orioles, or caciques, known all over Guiana as bunyas. In the creek bed below the dam, but within the radius of the clearing, stood a medium-sized tree, and among its branches a colony of scarlet-backed caciques were flying back and forth from their nests. We made a mental note of them at the time, but passed on giving them more than a glance. Later, near the bungalow, we occasionally saw them in small numbers associating, as we have already stated, with the lavender jays. As we wished to take a number of young caciques back to New York with us and to study the colony as thoroughly as we could in the space of a week's time, 
we started out early one morning for the cacique's tree. The long pendant nests were all 70 feet or more from the ground. Taking the rusty climbing irons from their case, we recalled vividly the last time they had been in use a cold june day in nova scotia when the nesting hole of the three-toed woodpecker had been the goal how different were these tropical surroundings bravely the start up the tree was made jab and pull jab and pull while the straps pressed in on ankle and knee giving that peculiar sensation that cannot be described but which every climbing naturalist knows so well. Ten, twenty, thirty feet were scaled, and then one's hand on the opposite side of the trunk broke through some tiny earthen tunnels, and, like many an unfortunate telegraph line man, struck a live wire. At least the sensation was very much the same only the electric shocks were here progressive and when they had reached the elbow they were seen to be a numerous and enthusiastically defensive horde of ants at one end a pair of jaws gave a firm point of leverage and attachment whereby the insect could secure a footing while operating the sting from the opposite end of his anatomy there have been martyrs to science as well as religion, but much as one might desire to look at those nests only forty feet above, it may be doubted if any man could have controlled his feelings and coordinated his muscles sufficiently to continue the ascent. The details of the descent were hazy. An exceedingly rough trunk seemed to shoot upward through one's embrace until the ground was reached and the caciques screamed their delight. They had seen many of the four-footed folk foiled in a similar manner, and now this new enemy, who scaled the trunk with two hands and two spurs, was equally baffled by the tiny allies of the birds. But study the colony we must, and selecting a line of soft, springy underbrush, we had an Indian drop the tree on it. A cloud of screaming caciques followed it to earth, scattering only as we ran up and began to gather the young birds. Out of the first nest there rushed a lizard about a foot in length, brown with head and forelegs bright green. He scurried like a streak of light across the red tailings, the speed sending him up on his hind legs so that his track was bipedal before we describe the condition of the colony as we found it when we reached the fallen tree it will be interesting to record its early history as far as we know it this was the first year of this colony of caciques as last year there were none nearer the clearing than the mouth of hurry creek three and one half miles away where in a tree overhanging the house of a black a colony has been in existence for two years. Three months ago, in January, one scarlet-backed cacique was observed in the clearing at the mine, but it soon vanished. Within a few days, however, a number of these birds appeared, perhaps guided by the solitary scout. They set to work at once, establishing their new colony in the tree which we had cut down so at the time we began to study this colony it could not have been older than three months the tree stood alone in the center of the tailings from the gold washing and twenty or thirty feet away from all the surrounding trees the finely sifted sediment of the tailings had broadened out the water of the creek bed so that it flowed delta like on both sides of the tree with their characteristic intelligence the caciques had taken advantage of this unusual condition and were thus guarded from enemies by the water by the isolation from other trees and by the far more formidable stinging ants which for many years had had their home on the trunk of the tree 
the little bird city as we found it contained thirty-nine houses three-quarters of which were on one branch seventy feet from the ground while ten were suspended from a smaller branch a few feet lower down of the thirty-nine nests four were only half finished while ten were empty having been already used and deserted this season the others may be divided as follows one nest contained an addled egg white with brownish spots chiefly at the larger end one nest had one egg containing a week old embryo two nests each had a skeleton of a well-grown young bird one of which had been caught about the neck and the other about the legs by fine flexible tendrils which had caused their deaths there were altogether twenty-eight young birds nine full-fledged sixteen with feathers just appearing while three were recently hatched they were distributed as follows fourteen nests containing one young bird seven nests containing two young birds the special distribution was as follows two well-fledged young in two nests one well-fledged young in five nests two partly fledged young in four nests one partly fledged young in eight nests two newly hatched birds in one nest one newly hatched bird in one nest the nests were typically cacique like made of stout rootlets and grasses while at the lower end was a cup-shaped lining of very fine grass and root hairs forming a soft bedding the nests varied from thirteen to eighteen inches in length and all but five had an upper roosting chamber built on above the entrance these five were built directly beneath a group of others and the bases of the ones above served as protecting roofs this was a most interesting adaptation in varying conditions just before felling the tree we noticed in several instances that both parents shared in the work of bringing food to the young ones almost all of the young were uninjured by the fall of the tree three were thrown out of the nests and these we chloroformed in order to find what their food had been the stomach of one was crammed with white seeds of two kinds one nearly round and about as large as the head of a pin while the others were longer perhaps one-third of an inch in length mingled with these seeds were remains of numerous insects beetles grasshoppers and caterpillars the two other birds which were younger and almost bare of feathers had received chiefly animal food as follows one a three-inch smooth caterpillar medium-sized spider many small bugs and a mass of berry seeds number two several one-inch cutworms spider small iridescent beetle yellow butterfly a few berry seeds the young birds were almost without down the adult plumage being outlined very shortly after hatching in a bird of only four or five days the dull orange or yellowish color of the rump feathers shows plainly when these break through their sheaths the color is a dull rose becoming redder as the feathers increase in length but not attaining the brilliant scarlet of the parent birds until the succeeding molt when full grown these birds measure about ten inches in length and are glossy black in color save only for the brilliant scarlet rump the bill is a conspicuous greenish white while the feet are black the eyes of the nestling are dark hazel in color while in the old birds the iris is of a most beautiful greenish blue the voice of the very young birds is a shrill incessant peep peep when they are gaping for food but the half-fledged youngsters utter solitary harsher notes under the same conditions the five fully fledged birds had learned what fear was and instead of feeding crouched down at the bottom of the artificial nest which mr crandall made for them 
but hunger overcame fear and before night all had taken food we kept an indian busy gathering a berry or fruit which looked tasted and smelled much like a miniature tomato the leaves of this low plant are large deeply incised and studded above and below with numerous thorns the plant is from three to six feet in height is abundant in the clearing and forms the favorite vegetable food of the caciques in addition to this the young birds had a few mealworms and ants eggs from our small store and all the soft insects which our indian could capture after two full days of grasshopper catching the pride of the noble red man began to feel itself injured and additional inducements in the way of tobacco were needed to sustain his interest in his orthopterous pursuits on the following day the oldest of the young caciques flew feebly to a low perch and nothing could induce him to return to his fellows again he uttered isolated call notes which however at the approach of food merged at once into the baby scream we had carried the young caciques a third of a mile to the veranda of the bungalow where they were put out of sight and sound of their parents yet early next morning four caciques had discovered their offspring and were flying back and forth close to the house carrying food in their beaks in an hour no fewer than twenty caciques had collected and on placing the young out in a low tree the parents came at once and fed them one bird which we watched carefully brought masses of caterpillars which it inserted within the wide mouth of the young although the young birds were mixed up five or six of the same size being placed together in one artificial nest yet there was no question about recognition on the part of the old birds at least there was no reckless undirected feeding certain young were fed by certain adults the second day after we had taken the young birds no caciques came to feed them and we found the reason was that the entire flock had begun to found a new colony in the very nearest tree to the one we had cut down about twenty feet away this too was isolated and protected both by shallow water and by the vicious tunneling ants some of the new nests must have been started the day before as the roost chambers were complete and in several the top of the nest itself was finished the rains had been rather heavy for a few days and may have influenced the early building of the shelters above the nest to the three or four inches of nest the birds were bringing beakfuls of fibers both sexes working energetically we were glad to know that our wholesale destruction of the first colony site had wrought no permanent change at the rate the birds were building the second colony would be in a flourishing state in another two weeks these red-backed caciques together with their near relatives the yellowbacks are most interesting birds and a careful study of the growth and daily routine of a colony would yield most valuable results they seem to trust more to the presence of man as a protection against enemies than to the guardianship of wasps but both methods are to be found we traced these birds all the way up the barama and from what we could learn none were found higher up the colony at hurry mine being the furthest outpost night life owing to our brief stay and the difficulty of exploration in this hilly and densely underwooded country we gained little thorough knowledge of the vertebrate fauna hereabouts the phase of tropical life which during the week of our stay was most striking was the wonderful host of insects attracted by the electric lights in the evening the bungalow contained four large rooms two on each side of a wide central passage extending through the house a kind of interior veranda open front and back this was the dining room 
where every day we feasted upon delicious dishes of peccary tinamou curacao and paca or bush hog mam powi and laba as we learned to call them in the vernacular here during the evening meal after the lights were turned on came legions of the most curious the most beautiful winged creatures imaginable we all turned entomologists and never tired of admiring the wonderful colors and bizarre shapes which night after night were revealed in never-ending array the first night crandall sent up an excited call of get a vial get a vial and this became our vesper slogan from the yard or veranda or room or kitchen hut would come the call from some of our party get a vial and the one nearest the array of bottles in the improvised laboratory would hasten to the aid of the discoverer who would probably be found with eyes glued to some strange creature and blindly reaching out behind for the approaching vial in which to capture his prize there were few insects of very small size and many indeed were gigantic as judged by our standards of the north none were unpleasant and they seldom attempted suicide in soup or cocoa they were content to flutter a moment about the electric globe and drop quietly to the white tablecloth praying mantises or rar hosses as our southern negroes call them would whir in and climb awkwardly over the bouquets of flowers swaying from side to side and now and then reaching out for some passing insect with a sudden unflexing of those murderous deceptive forelegs one which flew on the table was a new species which has been named stagmomantus hurry if exercise during meals is good for one's digestion then we were hygienic in the extreme for twenty times in succession we would have to go to the veranda laboratory to chloroform our captives the second evening although a heavy rain was falling a bewildering number of moths mostly small but of exquisite patterns dashed in between the drops there were almost never two alike indeed among one hundred species captured on two evenings there were but two duplicates it is folly to try to describe with any exactness the beauty even of the commonest plainest insect and how much more impossible to convey an accurate idea of these tropical beauties think of a sapling near an electric light covered with fifty or sixty exquisite moon moths Vysania agrippina pale creamy white banded and looped with lines of brown none less than nine inches in spread of wing and many reaching an even foot across the hawk moths that came to our table were all different all beautiful one a study in pale yellow another variegated green with blended purples and red argius labruscae on the hinder wings this one too bore on its eyes the long shaft of a pollen stalk from some night flowering orchid then a moth would come recalling somewhat the promethea and polyphemus of our childhood's collecting but with great transparent mirrors in the centre of the wings Attacus hesperia ericina next two as different as possible but which we learned later were sexes of the same species dirphia tarquinia the female large plain brown with a forked streak of light across the forewings her mate a full third smaller with rosy hind wings and forewings frosted white save for two conspicuous circles at the fork of his white lightning on the third evening there were fewer moths but many more beetles and grasshopper like insects green was the predominating color among the moths this evening from palest yellow green to darkest bottle green 
in some the green had a border sending ray-like lines across all four wings yellow and white were the colors almost always present in combination with the green the yellow being usually confined to the hinder wings a stain of gold was sometimes laid over the green and in one beauty the green seemed to have spattered a hazard over a milky white surface this proved to be a female of a species known only from a single male Rachelopha nivectata the female proving to be twice as large as her mate instead of burying the insects in envelopes or mounting them in the orthodox way with the four wings raised unnaturally until the hind edge is at right angles to the body we merely supported the wings and allowed them to dry in the natural position by doing this we usually lost sight of a part of the hinder wing but we gained the true relation of the spots and patterns on the four wings to those on the thorax and the result was in many instances surprising for example when spread the four wings of one tiny moth pronola fraterna showed two meaningless black spots forming each one-third of a circle when closed naturally these united with the black abdomen to form a perfect black circle stamped upon a mat of velvety cream color all words are inadequate to describe these exquisite creatures one with the lightning flash of gold across its cloudy background another inscribed with chinese hieroglyphics a third of lavender yellow and russet mosaics set about large transparent windows of opalescent blue one of the most exquisite was a little moth chrysocestus fimbriaria spreading less than an inch with wings of iridescent mother of pearl rimmed with dull golden on which was set a score of embossed beads of the most brilliant gilt flashing as no gem ever flashed if one could spend a season here studying the motions alone of these insects it would well repay him one moth iridescent with a broad border of black eudioptus hyalinata curled the abdomen straight up into the air and separated its extremity into a widespread tuft of hairs these radiated like the tentacles of a sea anemone and when the hole was waved about it looked like some strange crawling caterpillar holding its head high above the prostrate wings of the moth the last evening as if to make our departure still harder the insects increased in number walking sticks five and six inches in length skimmed through the air their bodies legs and wings dark in color and ornamented with irregular scales and projections until their resemblance to a jagged barked twig was perfection if this species were represented by thousands of individuals in its haunts birds or four-footed enemies would soon learn to detect even such an exact counterfeit and the protective value would be lost but in the tropics the infinite variety is the keynote to success in protective adaptation on the tablecloth at one time would be perfect green leaves katydid like orthopters green leaves with large worm-eaten defects or spottings some of the mantises and many brown lichened leaves and twigs moths and walking sticks even if two of the same species appeared at once the chances were that one would be much the larger and of an entirely different shade with a distinct individual pattern of mimic defects big owl moths hypercheria liberia hypercheria nausica automeria cinctistriga and others alternated with tree hoppers of all sizes with branched and rebranched horns rising from their thoraxes hemicticha umbonia spinosa and others the prize of one evening was a grasshopper terochroia ocellata which came in on the sleeve of the coolie butler 
it had alighted on the white cloth as he crossed the yard between the kitchen and the house its wide jagged forewings met closely above the back forming a half green half brown leaf complete even to the mid and side ribs on the hind wings were what we would merely guess were either sexual ornaments or warning markings visible only in flight the ground color of these translucent wings was a finely mottled yellow and brown while painted on the pleated surface were two eye spots like those upon the feathers of a peacock pheasant a dark velvety shaded portion with a delicately shaded ocellus at one edge the last insect captured was a tree hopper as big as a cicada mottled and marbled on the forewings and stained scarlet on the hinder in appendix c pages 397 398 i have added a list of a few of the moths and orthoptera collected on the dining table at hurry which have been identified End of chapter 6section 14 of our search for a wilderness by mary blair bb this librivox recording is in the public domain through the coastal wilderness with indians and canoe the most interesting observation we made on the launch trip from hoorie creek down the barama river was of a flocking of more than 200 big green caciques the birds of the liquid cow-bell notes which passed low overhead with a roar of cackling voices and a loud whistling of wings bound for some safe roosting place still another species to exhibit this common roosting habit we found farnum's deserted the family having gone down to georgetown so we took possession of the empty house swinging our hammocks on the porch and watching the sun sink over the river with the dark forest beyond growing ever darker as we had been told that there were no mosquitoes we had not hung our hammock nets and the droning hum of these miserable pests kept us awake for hours from across the river came the discontinuous labored puffs of an overloaded freight train pulling up a grade now and then the wheels would slip and four or five chugs would come in quick succession one could imagine the heavy trail of smoke and sparks the shining rails and the long line of heavy slowly moving cars then the sound ceased and far down the river another frog took up the chugging now and then the voice of a red baboon came to our ears and continually the mosquitoes zoomed and on the floor below our hammocks the dog whined unceasingly as he scratched his bet rouge when we opened our eyes lightning bugs of several candle power flashed above us in the thatch of the porch and by their light we could see big tarantulas dragging their prey here and there seeming ready to drop with fatigue at any moment all the sounds of the wilderness are lulling save that of mosquitoes when one is netless many times that night we wished ourselves back in the boat we had heard that there was a coast-wise way of returning to georgetown threading little known rivers and creeks in a small canoe the idea of exploring those charming little creeks at which all through the journey we had looked with longing was fascinating to us and we owe this realization of our dreams to mrs wilshire who planned the trip and gave it to us as a surprise this proved to be the most wonderful canoe voyage which any of us had ever taken for five days we were paddled portaged towed and pushed through a wonderland abounding in rarely beautiful birds butterflies and orchids we slept at night under our tiny tarpaulin or invaded and were made welcome at little isolated indian missions 
our pen falters at the thought of attempting to give any idea of the wonders of that trip but day by day we set down our impressions as best we could and here are some of them it was almost noon on the sixteenth of march before we had our men luggage and canoe in readiness to start pushing off we said good-bye to the rest of the party including crandall and his precious cargo of red-backed caciques and other live birds they were to return via morahana and the mazaruni direct to georgetown we secured a little canoe or ballyhoo about fifteen feet long with a tarpaulin stretched over the center in the bow were four indian paddlers two men and two boys while in the stern as steersman and paddler was a splendidly built carib indian marciano chief of the hoori woodmen amidships we piled our luggage and we distributed ourselves over and around the clothing bags and larder boxes mr and mrs wilshire and we too composed the list of passengers and the unceasing pleasure of those five days was a good test of mutual congeniality and adaptability to bush travel the stroke adopted by our indians was a peculiar one which we were to hear all day and often throughout the night for these men of the wilderness short and stocky in build seemed tireless and hour after hour they would keep hard at work sometimes for as much as thirty-six hours at a stretch with only a brief nap or two the indian paddle rhythm set by little pedro the younger boy in the bow accentuated every other stroke the tempo of the strokes becoming more and more rapid until when further speed was impossible one stroke was suddenly omitted and the gap thus formed marked the new slow tempo which in turn in the course of fifteen to twenty strokes of the paddle would work up to a climax and the former rhythm begin again all kept perfect time the new change not being inaugurated on any exact stroke but the others seeming to know instinctively when it would come whether they were eating talking or looking behind them it was the same all changed as one man two or three hours after starting we made a landing in order that the indians could cook their breakfast invariably composed of a combination of pork dried fish rice and cassava this menu was varied only when one or more of the ingredients happened not to be procurable sometimes for many days the guiana indians worked hard upon nothing but cassava the jungle was thick about the little clearing which they made for a fire and word passed rapidly along the lines of parasol ants that manna was available in the form of rice and breadcrumbs a few minutes after a bit of food was thrown down it would mysteriously take legs to itself and begin to walk away the motor power being myriads of these interesting insects big-headed soldiers patrolled all along the winding trail of foragers troubling no one unless they were disturbed or the workers attacked several species of orchids brassias and others unknown to us were in blossom all about us on we went again becoming more and more delighted with our method of travel there was no puffing smelly kerosene engine no clatter of many tongues and we were close to the water with nothing overhead between us and the sky or the overhanging branches the typical river birds paid little attention to our silent craft and we were able to watch giant kingfishers guiana cormorants snake birds parakeets and swallows at close range in sheltered places along the bank our canoe pushed through unbroken masses of the floating rosettes of leaves known as the shell flower pistia stratiotes the leaves are shell-shaped thick 
strongly ribbed and light velvety green in color covered with a coat of short dense hairs which repel the water so that when pushed beneath the surface the plant bobs up as dry as before thousands of these little plants become detached from their sheltered bays and are carried out to sea where they decay and disappear small water hyacinths were less common the river was full from recent rains in the interior and in some places for several hundred yards the surface was thickly covered with innumerable small yellow blossoms splashed with scarlet at their hearts while every now and then a large purple pea blossom would be seen these had doubtless fallen from the treetops where the river was narrower and the vines and branches overhung the stream many insects were carried down afloat on the blossoms and now and then a great hairy tarantula would appear with each of its eight feet in a blossom trying to keep his balance until he could reach solid ground again agami herons beautiful in their plumage of glossy green chestnut and blue were standing here and there in the shallows snatching the insects from the petals as they floated past at four o'clock in the afternoon we left the baramani river which had averaged about two hundred feet in width and entered the charming little biara which was only about sixty feet from shore to shore here the vegetation was very dense water lilies in hundreds with curious serrated leaves and a profusion of the sweetest of flowers we were paddling through literally a river of water lilies clavelina blooms hung low over our faces wild cocoa pods showed rich brown among the foliage mucka mucka with its great heart-shaped leaves was everywhere a plant which on a later trip was to interest us as forming the food of the hoatzin the air was filled with the sweet penetrating calls of the gold birds and wood hewers and now and then the puppy-like yaps of toucans pendant nests were numerous built so far out over the water that we could touch them as we passed thus safe from marauding monkey and opossum the stream was dotted with islets varying from a few inches to as many yards in circumference crowded with ferns and graceful sedges all perfectly reflected in the mirror like water one such islet of the smallest size was crowned with a single petaled white calla lily surrounded by a host of tiny purple orchid blossoms a square foot of perfect beauty and perfume set in the ebony water seldom were we out of sight of flowering orchid vine bush or tree orchids were in the ascendant and our tarpaulin brushed against long golden showers graceful shoots of cattleyas and curious green spider orchids there seems to be no autumn in this land and death comes only to single leaves while the variegated scarlet and yellow hues of new sprouting foliage made brilliant every bend of the stream the moriche or etta palm is dominant here and the vegetation of these lesser streams is dense and bushy intimate and delightful rather than grand and awe-inspiring as along the forest rim of the barama toucans and ant birds darted across the water ahead of us tree ferns stretched out their graceful fronds and sifted their pollen down upon us the bird songs of this region are not long and elaborate but there was no dearth of most delightful liquid phrases usually loud and penetrating six songs all wholly unlike one another reached us that day all unknown mysterious we steered close to the bank and picked a wild cocoa pod but found it unripe and the beans had only a raw aroma two long-snouted weevils crawled from the heart of the pod one of the myriad hidden forms of life in this wonderland 
now and then we passed a little open grassy savanna where the water was no longer brown but a clear black from the steeping of the decaying vegetation in many places the water leaves showed where manatees had been browsing and occasionally we caught sight of the huge ungainly creatures as they swam slowly upstream or nosed the vegetation along the bank all this and much else we passed in an hour and at five o'clock entered a third stream the barra barra the whole country hereabouts is swampy so when at dark we stopped for our evening meal we did not land but rested quietly among the lily pads the indians ate as they did everything else silently with only now and then some low guttural ejaculation we flashed our powerful electric light upon the lily pads and found that the water was full of active life scores of little fishes were resting motionless in the thin film of water covering the lily leaves some with the basal half of the body and two lines up and down from the eyes black marciano called them salaver in addition to other very slender fish there were numbers of little freshwater prawns shooting about among the maze of fanwort beneath the pads the glint of strange shapes came to us tiny cyclops and others which the human eye was powerless to name without a microscope we sat in the darkness listening to the sounds of the swampy jungle not a mosquito hummed and the frogs eclipsed all other lesser noises calling in basso and treble with tinkling bells and a clear ringing chime like the aeolian singing of a telegraph wire marciano climbed back to his seat in the stern gave an order and the paddles pushed sluggishly through the pads carrying fear and tumult to thousands of little aquatic lives the next four hours we shall never forget as long as we live on and on we went through the pitchy darkness guided solely by the light of the little bow lantern the bush ropes ahead stood out in sharp silhouette like giant serpents coiled in mid-air across our path the night seemed to press in on our tiny atom of life the shadows of the waving arms of the paddlers were thrown on the foliage behind the boat looking like some huge spider-like thing forever following it the sheets and drops of water thrown up by the indians gleamed like molten silver the open savannas increased in size and extended further on each side than the shaft of electric light could carry great tufts of pampas grass towered high above our heads drooping gracefully outward in all directions the channel narrowed and the lily blossoms increased until the water was thickly studded with them their odor hung heavy on the air and when one of the blossoms itself was smelled the perfume was as sweet and as overpowering as chloroform during the day they had been all but odorless for miles we pushed through the tangle of water plants in places the men having to drag and push the boat over the reeds and grasses crushing scores of spider lilies with the keel this is the back water divide between the rivers which flow northward into the waini and those which flow to the south during the dry season this route becomes impassable later we came to open pond like spaces and here we found another species of water lily with a smaller flower and a smooth edged leaf with maroon colored underside owls large moths and bats occasionally flitted across the field of light it was half past ten at night when marciano told us that we were turning into the maruca river we were to follow this river down to the very sea but here it was barely distinguishable as a narrow channel through the grass and reeds another hour passed and several dark forms loomed up in the dim light of our lantern 
and when we reached them we found that they were boats tied to a rough sort of landing we climbed out and stumbled sleepily about getting the cramped feeling out of our bodies then when the indians had tied up the boat and slung our hammock bags over their backs we followed them up the long avenue of lofty coconut palms which stretched down to the water's edge we felt our way slowly in the darkness walking stiffly and uncertainly after the cramped position in which we had been compelled to sit for so many hours at last marciano held high his lantern and we saw towering before us a huge white cross instinctively we all paused reverently whatever one's faith may be it is impossible to come thus upon the symbol of a great and ancient church standing in the midst of a vast and primeval wilderness without a feeling of awe and reverence there in the teeming ceaseless life of the wilderness was the mystery of creation and there stood the white cross a symbol of man's attempt to solve the tremendous problem of creation and immortality the light revealed a crude little church with an adjoining building standing behind the cross to this other building the indians led us we knocked gently then harder then pounded no response half a dozen dogs gathered and howled mournfully at last finding a side door ajar we entered a spacious room part dining room part schoolroom with a loom and a half-finished indian hammock in one corner we called and shouted we pounded on the floor and walls and at last from the distance upstairs came an answering roar down to us came the jolliest priest we ever hoped to meet two strange men and women had invaded his castle at midnight routing him out of well-earned rest and yet his welcome was as warm as though we were expected friends our jovial host furnished us with lights and gave us permission to sling our hammocks from the rafters of the great schoolroom about one o'clock in the morning we rolled into our swinging couches completely tired out but sleep was not to be had at once an ominous gritting squeak was heard then another and our faces were softly fanned by invisible wings vampires came the exclamation from the furthermost hammock never mind them answered a sleepy voice from mr wilshire's hammock doctors say bleeding is healthful the scientist echoed his sentiments but in vain we had to dive down into the clothing bags and pull out the hammock nets now these articles are somewhat difficult to adjust under the best of conditions and this night they were perversity itself we found that in the packing at hoori the nets had become mixed and two were of an unknown pattern with apparently no entrance hole except at the ends a hammock net is shaped like a buttoned up coat with a hammock running through the sleeve portions it is an acrobatic feat not soon to be forgotten when one is dead tired and in the dark and has to enter his net by climbing up to the end of the hammock rope and sliding down through a small long chute of netting it was two in the morning before we were settled and as we finally dropped asleep a score of fierce little demon faces were squeaking and gibbering at us at six o'clock the following morning we were awakened by a dozen little naked indian boys flitting silently about peering at us like tiny copper elves or like human incarnations of the bats which had hovered about us during the night going outdoors in the dusk we heard a perfect medley of bird notes wrens thrushes tanagers seed eaters all giving voice at once while from the further end of the coconut walk came a chorus from a colony of yellow-backed caciques. We saw the mission cat teasing something and took from her a tiny opossum with fur of richest brown and no larger than a mouse. The little creature was unhurt, 
but played possum until it recovered from its fear when it made itself at home in a small suitcase when our jolly priest appeared to wish us good morning the little indian lads bowed their bronze figures reverently and kissed his hand some of them busied themselves weaving a hammock while others set the table and later served us at breakfast our priest was like the genial monk of a medieval story he was delightful with his tribe of small indian boys ordering them about in a great voice but with his eyes beaming with affection for them man alive he would shout bring the finger bowls and to our amazement the wee naked valet not only knew what finger bowls were but actually produced them passing them around the table with colossal dignity that man's a linguist the father added he speaks english spanish and several indian dialects the good father's heart was overflowing with kindness toward every living thing he could not even bear to see his cat waiting hungrily for her breakfast but ordered his small butler at once to give her some milk we wondered why the father's indian boys had such straight slim well-proportioned figures instead of the unwieldy cassava stomachs so characteristic of the little savage indians with a twinkle in his eye the father told us that his first step in converting the small indian lad to christianity was a huge dose of castor oil then regular hours and regular meals of nourishing food instead of allowing them to munch cassava all day then one might proceed by teaching them the doctrine and always a useful trade while after that was achieved there was plenty of time for a more literary education if the individual warranted it he had reason to be proud of his method for in all our travels we never met a missionary whose works spoke louder than those of father gillette for the most successful and worthy indians in the colony had been trained by him some of them had become excellent engineers others priests and still others had learned good trades after breakfast the father took us through the chapel followed by his dusky little tribe all crossing themselves piously before the altar he showed us with pride the decorations of the altar and the ceiling all the work of himself and his little indians the ceiling represented the dome of heaven bright blue and dotted with a multitude of white stars when we called our little pedro the youngest of our indian paddlers to tell marciano that we were ready father gillette's eyes filled with tears and he said is your name pedro i lost a lovely pedro he died of fever last easter i did not know i could miss him so much he used to talk to me he was not like the other indian boys he loved to talk then turning to us he added simply it is a lonely life sometimes you know end of section fourteen section fifteen of our search for a wilderness by mary blair b b this librivox recording is in the public domain we were told that white women had never before passed through that part of british guiana so unexpectedly did we arrive at midnight and so early did we depart next morning that perhaps our visit seems as unreal to the good father as it sometimes does to us like a very vivid dream which we can never forget he loaded us with gifts of coconuts and fruit and in the fresh coolness of early morning we again set forth on our journey just as we were paddling away the father ordered all his small boys into the water for their regular morning swim head first they went splashing about as gaily as a school of strange copper-colored fish we found as we went on that the maruca changed rapidly in character it was no wider but the water lilies and pampas grass disappeared and a softer finer grass covered the marsh dotted with a host of purple and yellow flowers rising from some aquatic plant isolated trees became more numerous 
and great woodpeckers resembling our splendid ivory bills looped here and there swallow-tailed kites dipped and soared and kiskadees shrieked near the occasional huts of the indians at noon we lunched on herbs wurst and jam at a protestant mission waramuri where a small colony of red-backed caciques were established a school of about fifty indian children were studying and reciting at the top of their lungs we left in an hour and from here on the maruca widened and consequently lost somewhat in interest the low elevation on which the english mission is built is composed wholly of fine white sand and beyond this mangroves began to appear and the foliage became less diversified we landed for an hour at a small coconut plantation and found a most ingenious method of improving time and space until the main crops should yield rice was planted in long narrow trenches which are flooded twice a day between these trenches the young coconut palms are placed and in the spaces separating the palms cassava and coffee are grown while between them in turn and around the edge of the trenches were plantain and tania the catch crops are thus made to pay for the price of the land and labor land virgin forest can be empoldered and ditched for thirty five dollars an acre the first year's two rice crops will repay this and continue to do so for five years when the coconuts will yield a regular income for fifty or sixty years this at least is the calculation of the agriculturist deer peccaries and capybara are found on this little clearing and we saw several of the latter animals running about among the underbrush on the bank mealy amazon parrots were nesting in an inaccessible stub ant birds of several species were by far the most abundant birds everywhere the undergrowth was flaming with sharp pointed scarlet blossoms on long stalks which a native called wild plantains below the plantation mangroves composed the only vegetation visible along the banks of the river and before long our canoe began to rise and fall with the swell of the sea for days the smell of the damp tropical marshes had filled the air and now we sniffed eagerly at the invigorating salt breeze we lowered the tarpaulin tied everything fast and prepared balers under the direction of marciano at last rounding a curve of the river we came in sight of the sea a vast stretch of turbulent brown water a kakoi heron and an american egret flew away with protesting croaks and we began to pitch and toss as we turned south beyond the outermost sprawling mangrove roots we had been warned on no account to make this part of the trip with other than full-blooded indian paddlers and when we saw the need for steady skilful work we were indeed glad that we had marciano and his good crew the waves were too muddy to break but they rolled high over the low rail of our canoe and we were soon soaked through and had to bail steadily to keep the frail craft from filling in the midst of all the excitement three splendid flamingos flew overhead one close behind the other necks and legs extended to the full we watched them until our eyes ached and then a dash of several quarts of salt muddy water in our faces brought us suddenly back to grim reality after we had paddled three or four miles we entered the broad mouth of the pomeroon turned close in along shore and finding a sheltered bite waited for the turning of the tide and to give our indians a much needed rest the heavily laden canoe had given them a hard paddle against the wind and tide and we were to travel onward throughout all the night as dusk settled down a frigate bird swooped past followed by a large flock of several hundred boat-billed herons croaking like their relatives the night herons and on their way doubtless from some roosting place to their nocturnal feeding grounds 
for as they reached the water they scattered some going up the river others along the shore from the east straight across the whole width of the pomeroon came another great flocking a host of mealy amazon parrots flying as usual two and two close together by hundreds and by thousands they turned south along our bank and flew inland and were joined almost over the spot where our canoe was moored by another great multitude of their kind coming steadily down the coast at the very lowest estimate there were eight or ten thousand parrots once and only once we saw a solitary individual unaccompanied by a mate while still in view he attempted to attach himself to a pair of birds whereupon both dashed at the unfortunate intruder and drove him headlong out of sight below the level of the branches it is indeed a serious thing to lose one's mate if one is a parrot to be a widow or a widower is to be an outcast at ten minutes past six the parrots vanished in the dusk and true to its name a six o'clock bee a species of large cicada sent out its shrill whistle from the mangrove to which our canoe was tied here for the first time since we left farnham's we encountered mosquitoes and sand flies but oil of tar did much to discourage them it is a curious fact that although the prevailing wind blows in the direction from which we had come yet these troublesome insects are said never to pass beyond the line of the pomeroon's mouth after an hour of paddling we stopped for a supply of water at a tiny portuguese store built on piles and going by the name of pokapu it was a weird little place with rows of tiny shelves on which were bottles of lemon soda which was remarkably good and an assortment of ribbons knives and paddles for trade with the indians we purchased some well-made carob indian baskets and stumbled over a caged guan or maroodi as they called it ordered it sent to georgetown where it appeared the following week and is now a contented inmate of the new york zoological park at nine o'clock we started on our all-night paddle up the pomeroon like most tropical nights near the sea the air was chilly we rolled up in our blankets and anointed our faces with the tar oil the scientist chose as his night's couch one of the long sloping side seats the slope was only a fraction of a degree but gravity and drowsiness would invariably cause the downfall of the occupant of the seat much to the disturbance of the canoe's equilibrium as we lay and listened to the strange rhythm of the paddles and watched the brown current swash past the side of the boat we thought of all the exciting scenes this river and this coast had witnessed the ill-fated search for el dorado by sir walter raleigh then the capture and recapture of the colony no less than three times by dutch and british later came a period of great prosperity when hundreds of sugar plantations yielded great profits to their owners and the social life was as gay as that of our old virginia then followed the ruin of the sugar industry bands of runaway slaves taking to the wilderness and now today the chimneys of the old mills are often the only marks of former civilization which the jungle has not obliterated we skirted the mangroves for hours and saw nothing but an endless succession of those weird stilted plants while scores of four-eyed fish skipped and slithered over the mud or dashed across our bow attracted by the glow of our lantern in the electric light they looked pale and ghostly against the black mud at midnight we passed a light which showed the location of marlborough police station two hours later we heard weird music from a tom-tom and a four-toned fife or flute crude as it was it had a wild melody and the syncopated or ragtime was perfect we could see the hut near the water 
and hear the shouts of the dancers as we passed down the center of the river we were hailed by a canoe of half-drunken negroes who put off and wished to accompany us up the river marciano gave a low command and one of the indians muffled the lantern then all swung together in a new rhythm the full speed paddle rhythm of the caribs and we fairly flew through the water after every five minute spurt our crew rested for a few seconds to locate our unwelcome pursuers at first they cursed us and paddled furiously but their tipsy efforts were no match for our lithe red men and the negroes soon dropped out of sight and hearing there was no moon but throughout all the night whenever we awoke the southern cross gleamed brilliantly down at us and almost in the zenith orion stood ever poised in his gigantic stride as usual frogs and toads furnished most of the nocturnal music and we spent an hour or more in classifying the various utterances among them was the telegraph toad who spoke in a regular make and break morse code sending his wireless messages to his mate another heard more rarely was what we called the wing beat frog this species gave out a muffled throbbing roar like the hurried wing beats of a swan in full flight it would last for five seconds to be answered instantly by another across the river from the wonderland of the narrow biara we had come out upon the boundless expanse of the ocean passing thence to this splendid river a half mile across but we had far from finished the experiences and variety of this ever to be remembered trip at daybreak we pushed through a tangled mass of lilies and water hyacinths into a tiny cano or creek and in a soft rain while the tired indians slept beneath protecting palm leaves we cooked herbswurst and cocoa the morning chorus was infinitely sweet from flocks of invisible songsters a trembling descending chord of three notes rising at the end in a plaintive questioning way at eight o'clock we went on again the indians apparently perfectly rested after their two hours sleep the pomeroon narrowed to about a hundred yards mangroves disappeared and mucka mucka with its oblong pineapple like fruit took their place flowers were abundant white convolvulus wild sorrel pink with deep corollas large yellow blossoms with scarlet hearts and many other varieties four-eyed fish were still common and great rufous cuckoos lesser kiskadees and swallow-tailed kites were building nests at pickersgill police station we stopped for lunch these posts are the sole representatives of law and order in the wilderness and here the semi-military organization of negro police have their quarters most of them are men of unusually large size and in disposition they are pleasant and obliging they never fail to do their best to make us comfortable the duty of these men is varied besides being responsible for the good conduct of the inhabitants of their districts they keep account of shipments and all passing boats and passengers and stand ready to run down or rather paddle down fugitives from justice at each post are little rooms reserved for travelers and here any strangers with proper credentials are at liberty to swing their hammocks and make themselves at home the sergeant had just trapped a half dozen pretty blue and yellow violet euphonia tanagers in a mango tree near the station the usual colony of yellow-backed caciques was deserted at the time of our visit but had been occupied twice during the last year lying half in the water in front of the house was an anaconda fifteen feet long which had just been shot we purchased thirty bananas for four pence and with fried bananas and bacon the unfailing and never cloying herbswurst jam educator crackers and lime squash we had a meal fit for the gods at this point we left the pomeroon and turned up the harlepiaca for two hours 
then into the last real river of our trip the tapacuma this river was only about seventy-five feet wide and with vegetation neither grand nor very luxuriant principally etta palms and mucka mucka while cocoa and clavelina blossoms were everywhere and numerous lesser kiskadees were building many small deserted estates appeared as the river grew narrower and morpho butterflies and silver-beaked tanagers haunted the half-overgrown ruins catching sight of a snake on an overhanging branch we persuaded marciano to steer close to it but as we reached out to seize it our indian's fears overcame him and he swung out quickly the serpent making its escape into the water it was a harmless species about five feet long and yellow-brown in color with the exception of the dead anaconda it was the only snake we had seen on our trip when we commented on this marciano relieved his feelings in two words me glad it was dead high tide although the water was fresh backed up by the salt tide further down the surface seemed to be covered with rubbish and at first glance it looked as unsavory as the water in a new york ferry slip but when we examined it the flotsam proved to be composed of a host of various nuts and seeds many of which were beginning to send out roots and leaflets they were of all shapes and sizes from large flat disc like pods and round vegetable ivory nuts to smaller ones covered with corrugated husks fluted or polished like metal the river became still more narrow and twisted and turned to every point of the compass flowers were abundant and we noted at least twenty species with large and conspicuous blooms a bluebell blossom was especially characteristic of the tapacuma growing up from the water six to thirty inches there were few lilies and the predominating tree was one with sensitive foliage which went to sleep in the late afternoon several species of orchids in full flower were common and from one branch we pulled into the canoe a string of a dozen plants of a most fragrant white orchid epidendrum nocturnum the whole region was very different from that of the biara but no less interesting just before sunset we came to the fairyland of tapacuma lake we had zigzagged through many miles of tortuous channels with copper-colored indian hunters passing us now and then silently in their small canoes at last we came to a portage a gentle slope up which our canoe was dragged over the divide and into the great grassy expanse of water savanna in the center of which is the dark deep lake we walked a few yards into the woods to see some falls which turned out to be only a moderately foamy rapid and on the way we disturbed a large troop of monkeys which limbed off slowly through the branches and then hurried back to our boat for we were still far from anna regina where we planned to spend the night on and on we went the darkness settling quickly down a new castanet frog raised its voice this was really remarkable a syncopated oriental rhythm clicking musically and held by one frog for only a minute or two when another instantly took up the little tune this shifting of place the music sounding first here then further on made it seem as if some invisible dancer were swiftly whirling over the reeds and tools we could hear the clicking of the castanets and the tinkling of anklets and the thought was made more vivid as a bejeweled coolie woman passed us in a long narrow dugout paddled swiftly by her husband the water was very high and a wide new channel among the grasses so confused marciano that we paddled for an hour before we realized that we were lost we changed direction and guided ourselves by the stars passing some dense grass through which we had to push laboriously at last marciano sent a clear penetrating call through the night and the coolie answered far ahead and to the left we called twice after that 
and then came into a canal and soon were alongside two canoes blocked by a lock we would have as soon expected to find a motor car here in the wilderness as a canal lock but nevertheless there was a canal lock with no one to operate it by our combined efforts we opened it passed through and found ourselves surrounded by miles of sugar-cane fields we had entered the back door as it were of the great sugar plantation of anna regina one of the few which are still in operation we were on the home stretch and the indian boys towed us the remaining distance running at full speed tumbling head over heels into the water and forgetting for once their usual indian stolidness they giggled and chattered as if they were out for a lark instead of having paddled a heavily laden canoe on thirty-six hour stretches at midnight we reached the end of the canal and a hundred yards up a road we found the anna regina police station the guard turned out cleared away the judge's bench and witness box in the courtroom and laid blankets for us on the benches as there were no rafters for our hammock ropes our indians would not come near the dreaded prison house but left our baggage at the entrance they said good-bye as they were to start back at once we had grown to have a real affection for these simple men and boys and found them the best of travelling companions silent courteous and wonderful workers may the time come when marciano will again pilot us through that beautiful region to which no pen or camera can do the slightest justice the following morning after a walk through the neighboring coolie village of henrietta where we purchased some yellow-bellied calistes and other birds we secured a carriage with a horse and a mule as motor power and drove to sudi taking the steamer thence down the essequibo river to georgetown end of section fifteen end of chapter seven through the coastal wilderness with indians and canoe